I'd just like to announce before um, Professor Ape Epstein um, introduces the speaker for tonight, that we have another speaker on the same subject. Uh, uh, well, I don't know what you call it, discrimination against the Jews. Uh, <clears throat> next Thursday, not tomorrow, or Thursday this week, but Thursday following, Dr. Mikhail Stern from the Soviet Union who uh, is invo was involved in a very famous case in the last few years. Uh, he was an endocrinologist, and uh, <coughs> his sons wished to, our children, I think they were both sons, but wished to emigrate to Israel, not Dr. Stern, but because he didn't block it <coughs> as a result of that, he was brought to trial and all sorts of things were trumped up against him. Uh, <clears throat> and as a result, he was sentenced to a labor camp, we call them these days, uh, in uh, Siberia. Uh, 50 Nobel Prize winners <clears throat> wrote, including Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, to the Soviet government asking that he be released uh, to no avail. And uh, appeals were made early, I think in January or February, to um, President Jimmy Carter. In the meantime, a um, tape was smuggled out of Soviet Russia, <clears throat> and much like Watergate, tape of the trial, and as a result, he was suddenly uh, freed and has come to America just recently. He will speak, incidentally, in Russian. Uh, he does speak English, but he feels incapable of uh, handling the English language that well. We, we will have an interpreter. But uh, the trial, the tape of the trial, is now in publication, by the way, by Horizon Books. And he will speak on the concept of Soviet justice, guilty until proved guilty is his title. And it will be, unfortunately, and I say that truly, uh, in the, um, what you call it, uh, upstairs, Great Hall, because we couldn't get into it another, I would prefer, a slightly smaller room. But uh, <clears throat> he will speak on that subject, and I think it is of interest to many of the people in this audience. So we have two in a week's time dealing with this subject of discrimination, not more than discrimination, but uh, really harassment of Jewish people around the world. <clears throat> in two different countries. Now, uh, Dr. Epstein, I said I would introduce him as the Elm Man, and he said absolutely no, but I'll, anyway, Dr. Abraham Epstein will introduce our speaker for this evening, very quiet. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Lurie. Uh, on behalf of the University Lecture Bureau and the Ames Jewish Congregation. And we forgot to insert the B'nai B'rith Hillel organization. I welcome you to an experience. I met Gerda Klein for the first time this evening. And I found her to be a most beautiful, fascinating person. You may have heard of Goethe before now. She is an, an author of some note, has published a number of books. The reason she is here with us tonight, that she is a native of Poland, and as a teenager, experienced what most of world Jewry has come to know as the Holocaust. 
At the age of 15, the world that she knew came to a crashing end. Somehow, apparently, she survived and has established what must be a semblance of normal, normal, normalcy. She is married, is the mother of three children, and she told me with uh, some pride that she is a grandmother twice over. And in, in addition to being an author, she happens to be married to a husband who is a printer. She assured me, however, that this had no bearing on her professional life. <laughs> I don't think we invited you here to enjoy yourselves. I assume that you won't. But I hope that it will make you think, because it will be a thought-provoking experience. Mrs. Klein. Can I possibly thank you? Not only for your kind words, but to, for the warm welcome in your home this evening. Dr. Lurie, ladies and gentlemen, this is always a difficult moment. A moment when the past and the present comes to almost shocking proximity. The last few hours I spent in your midst, we were discussing many things, but gently you never probed the past. You let me enjoy myself and let me talk about my granddaughters. I'm deeply grateful. However, I guess this is the moment when you wish me to turn back the clock, so to speak and to illuminate for a moment a dark chapter of human history. I'm frequently asked, and with frightening frequency now, do I see a parallel between the times in which we live and the times when Hitler came to power? I must confess I really don't remember. I was nine years old when Hitler came to power and 15 when the war broke out. But what I do remember very clearly are the conversations I listened to in my parents' home about that maniac Hitler, as he was usually referred to, who threatened to commit some unspeakable crimes. I'm sorry to say it was usually dismissed. It was dismissed with complacency and perhaps a degree of smugness. And the conversation usually went something like that. It cannot possibly happen here. After all, this was not medieval Russia. This was not the mad monk Rasputin. This was the Germany of the 20th century. The country of Goethe, of Bach, of Franz Werfel, of Thomas Mann. It cannot possibly happen here. It did happen. And I remember, I remember well, the beautiful sunny day in the autumn of 1939, September 3rd to be exact, when, as you put it, the world I knew and loved and was a part of was irrevocably destroyed. I know that you have heard and read, for I know you to have most sophisticated audience, about the Holocaust, about the reign of terror in Europe under Hitler. And I know that the word Holocaust usually brings forth an image of man's inhumanity to man, 
of tragedy, of despair, and it seems to hang above the human horizon like some dark, ominous cloud, and people are afraid to touch it. Afraid that the horror will somehow spill and invade our lives. I should like to, in some way, dispel this image. Not that it wasn't true, it was only too true. But I would like to address myself to the other dimension, the one which also dwelt in the camps. And that is the beauty, the love, the friendship, and the sharing. And since those who perished there left no children behind, you are now the spiritual heirs, and you take and can take great pride in the legacy which has been left to you as members of the human race. I know it's impossible to speak in terms of numbers, it is frequently mentioned six million. I think this is a mistake. I think we should remember that not only six million Jews were killed by Hitler during World War II, but 22 million people in Europe, the others were not Jewish. I remember some years ago, I spoke at a library meeting in Canada, and a gentleman in the audience asked me if it was true that not six million Jews were killed by Hitler but only five million. What is give or take a million lives if your own or the life of your family doesn't happen to be among them? I believe it's the identification with one that counts and we can then multiply the numbers in our hearts. Let me therefore, and especially for the benefit of the young people here tonight, tell you the story of one who did not survive. She possessed in great quantity the qualities I mentioned before. As a matter of fact, it is because of her that I'm alive today, because of her friendship, her love and her caring. Her name was Ilse. She was a childhood friend of mine. Ilse and I grew up together. Our mothers were close friends. Whenever my mother would visit hers, she would usually ask me to come along and play with Ilse. Unfortunately, my mother knew little of child psychology because she usually added what a well-behaved, nice, good little girl Ilse was, and predictably, I never wanted to play with that paragon of virtue. <laughs> Yet, when we were together, we always managed to have a nice time. Ilse was a gifted little girl. She was sent to Vienna to study at the Conservatory of Music when she was 10 years old, having shown great promise as a pianist. And since I'm almost tone deaf, we didn't share as the mention of her art. And then the war broke out and Ilse came home. There were few Jewish children in our town, and fewer yet when we were moved to the ghetto. That's when we became very close. When we were sold on the slave markets of Germany for three dollars and fifty cents for life, it was the equivalent of about ten German Reichsmarks, which was the price for a Jewish girl in those days, we became to each other the only family we had. Ilse left me a legacy of many memories and two incredibly beautiful gifts. The first was in a camp called Greenberg. On the way to the factory in which we worked, one morning she found a raspberry in the gutter. She carried it in her pocket all day long, against only God knows what temptation, to present it to me that night on a leaf which she plucked through the barbed wire. Do you know what it's like to live in a world where your total possession is one slightly bruised, dust-covered raspberry, and to give this treasure to a friend? The tragedy is that she 
She never tasted another raspberry again. She died in my arms on a wet meadow in Czechoslovakia. She was 18 years old. We were then on the last leg of our journey, termed as the Death March. You might have heard about the Death March. It derived its name from a simple fact. It's one of the 4,000 young girls who were forced on that winter march, January 29, 1945. We walked a little more than four months. We covered a little more than a thousand miles. And at its conclusion, on May 7th of 1945, of the 4,000, only 120 were left. I survived. My friend Ilse did not. In the last bitter hour of her young and fulfilled life, she gave me the greatest gift of them all the gift of my own life. For she asked me to promise her to go on for one more week. A week in those days was a very long time. Obviously, I did go on. And a week later, precisely to the day, perhaps to the very hour of her death, we were liberated by American forces. I went on because I was incredibly lucky. I had a good physical constitution. And by listening to my father, who three years earlier, on the day on which I left home, on the 29th of June, he suddenly asked me where my skiing boots were. And when I asked him why, he said, I want you to wear them. And I said, but Papa, skiing shoes in June? I would have walked away in a pair of sandals. I was sure I'd be home in a couple of weeks, and it was so hot. But one didn't argue with one's father. So I put on the skiing boots. I wore them for three years, every season. They were instrumental, I'm sure, in saving my life on this cold march. And in them also, I carried the pictures of my parents and my brother, which appear in my book. And so on May 7th, in a small, obscure village in Czechoslovakia called Volari, which has no distinction, save perhaps one, that Smetana's immortal Moldau has its rippling beginning among its hills. That's where the march came to a halt. The 4,000, 120 were left. But even the small number was too much for our captors, who decided that they must destroy the last witnesses to their deeds. I'm fully aware what I'm about to tell you now sounds like a cheap thriller. We were locked into a barrack under which a time bomb was attached. We heard American planes overhead the shooting of American artillery close by. We also knew with equal certainty that we would not be privileged to know the joy of freedom. It was then, and I guess in biblical times this would be termed as miraculous, that a torrential rain fell, a rain which resulted in mud, preventing the bomb and timer from connecting, and it never went off. After some time, I can't recall how long, we heard shouts in Czech that if anyone was there to get out, and the war in Europe was over. What does one feel in such a moment? I confess I recall no feeling at all. I don't know if I was too ill to distinguish a dream of six years from reality, or else if God in his providential wisdom creates an emotional vacuum at such a time. But I remember very clearly my first visual impact of freedom. Some people say that a jeep is an ugly car. It can be the most beautiful sight in this world. We saw a jeep coming down the hill. 
Its color is no longer green. It's a white star of the Third American Army emblazoned on its hood. Two men in strange uniforms jumped out, came running toward us, asking if anyone spoke English or German. I was propelled forward, facing the first American I had ever met in my life. I remember a feeling of awe and wonder sweeping over me. There were people in this world who cared and who fought for our freedom and our ideals. But of course, I had been well indoctrinated by the Nazis to identify immediately that we were Jewish. So I looked at this man who granted me freedom. He looked to me like a young God. And I said, we are Jewish, you know. For a long time, he didn't answer me. And finally, in a voice that was choked with emotion, he said, so am I. This was the greatest hour of my life. Before I recovered, he asked a strange question. He asked if he could see the other ladies, a form of address unknown to us for six long years. I told him that most of the girls were inside. They were too ill to walk. He asked me to come with him. And by doing so, did something which at first I didn't understand. And when I understood it, I couldn't believe it. He simply held the door open for me and let me proceed. And in this beautiful symbolic gesture, he restored me to humanity again. I love to tell that story with pride, with joy, with love. Since you are not familiar with the rest of my story, I should like to add that this first young American officer of Liberation Day is now my husband. And so the war in Europe was finished for me. I know it's a bit embarrassing for a grandmother to be telling a romantic tale, but I was young once, you know. <laughs> And this is how I come here. The happy ending of my personal story, in retrospect, seems almost too bad to be true. I could add, gratefully, humbly, that indeed we were much blessed. But I must confess that it really isn't quite as simple. Having seen what I have seen, having lost what I have lost, I feel that survival puts a deep obligation on the survivor to write and to talk on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. For the books that are lately been written, that the Holocaust didn't happen. I cannot understand how such statements can be made in the presence of those who have been there. The Germans never denied it. I remember when I first started writing my experiences. I wrote it not for publication. I felt it was too personal, too intimate a story. But perhaps it was a desire for almost like very extensive psychoanalysis or catharsis to write the story down. It was about 20 years ago, in the homes of friends of ours, when the conversation about Nazi Germany got around the dinner table. And I voiced some rather strong opinions. Whereupon a friend of mine turned to me and she said, Gerda, what's the matter with you? Can't you discuss it from an intellectual point of view? Why do you get so emotional? And I turned to her and said, Claire, do you expect me to discuss the murder of my family and my years in a concentration camp from a cool, detached, 
dispassionate point of view. Whereupon this person who had known me, I thought well for a number of years, said, but girl, are you went in a concentration camp? I said to her, with my accent and my name, where do you think I was? She knew, of course, that I had come from Europe, but somehow she had never put the two together. And when I pressed her why she found it unacceptable, she gave me an answer which started my work. She said, I don't know. I guess because you are so much a part of us. And I think this is when I knew for the very first time. That so, of course, people knew that it happened, but it must have happened far away. Not only in a different time and different land, but to different people. Because if it happened to someone who lives on your street, whose children go to kindergarten with yours, with whom you go to symphony or to a dinner, then it could have happened to you. And I remember driving home that night and saying to my husband, I think I should try to submit my book for publication. I was very fortunate it was accepted. And then, a while later, one day I received a call from my publisher. And he said, you should write a preface to your book. Now, I know very little about writing books, and much less about writing prefaces. And perhaps a few days later, my younger daughter, who was then about two, three years old, woke up. And when I went to her room, she told me some fantastic story about monsters coming to her room, you know, the sort of things that children invent. And I said to her, Leslie, you had a nightmare. Go back to sleep. And she went back to sleep, but I didn't sleep that night. I went downstairs to the living room. I sat on the floor and I wrote what became the preface of my book. I should like to quote it for you now. As I finish the last chapter of my book, I feel at peace at last. For I have discharged a burden and paid a debt to many nameless heroes resting in their unmarked graves. For I am haunted by the thought that I might be the only one left to tell their story. Happy in my new life, I have penned the last sentence of my past. I have written my story with tears and with love, and in the hope that my children, safely asleep in their cribs, should not awaken from a nightmare and find it to be reality. End of quote. My little girls are all grown up. Both are mothers. I find myself with the same prayer in my heart for the safety of my grandchildren's sleep, your children, and perhaps some of your grandchildren. Do you see, because I approach grandmotherhood with a feeling of awe bordering unholiness, for I'd like you to know that of my entire family, which numbered about 76 people, I'm the only one who had the privilege of holding her grandchild in her arms. I think only through knowing and understanding the past, through knowing what hatred and prejudice can do, can we understand and forge and hold dear the priceless gift of freedom, which so many of us have learned to take for granted. Lastly, I would like to share with you a thought. The question I am most frequently asked, especially by young people, is why did you go on? And I guess it does not apply only to a tragedy as horrid as the Holocaust, but it must be in every person's mind that wonder would I ever be able to face 
something which seems so insurmountable. Here I should like to pause for a minute and share with you something which I believe is not too widely known. The last camp I was in, we were 2,000 girls before an additional transport of 2,000 was added before we started on the death march. 2,000 girls from every socioeconomic background, every level of intelligence. We had girls who came from privileged, pampered homes. We have girls who were very poor. We had girls who had been graduates of Europe's most prestigious universities. And we had people who were almost totally illiterate. All put together in one camp. People who came from religious homes. Girls who were only half Jewish and were not brought up Jewish, didn't know anything about it. All given the yellow star to wear. We were always hungry. Always cold. Outside, the camp was surrounded by barbed wire, which was electrically charged. Through my entire stay in the camps, which was a little over three years, I know of not one case of suicide or one nervous breakdown. What a magnificent tribute to the spirit of young people to prefer life, no matter how miserable, no matter how hopeless, to death. I think this is what's important for young people to know. The preciousness and the preservation of life. And to never, never give up. And suddenly I had a thought. I thought if by some miraculous power, one wish would be granted to me. Just one wish out of everything that is possible in this world. What would I want most? Would it be beauty, or fame, or wealth, or what? And then I saw it taking shape before my startled mental eye. And what I saw was very simple. I saw a picture of an evening at home. The living room of my childhood. The lamp throwing a soft glow against the walls I knew and loved. My father smoking his pipe and reading the evening paper. My mother working at her needlepoint. My brother and I doing our homework. And I stood struck by the enormity of a thought that those were the evenings I used to take for granted. A boring evening at home when seen through a window of a concentration camp. This became the most beautiful, most radiant, most unattainable sight in this world. And this is when I knew, as I had never known before, that to be a part of one more evening at home with my family would be the driving force to my own survival. I was not privileged. I never saw any member of my family nor my childhood home again. But I wish I could somehow convey to you the joy I always feel at the thought of returning home. At the knowledge that my husband, our home will be there. And that no power, at least on this earth, I pray, can rightfully take him from me again. If there therefore is one personal message that I would like to leave with you tonight, this is the one. When you return to your homes tonight, approach them slowly. Approach them as a stranger would. A stranger who has no home, no family, no belonging, and no hope for tomorrow. And then through the eyes of this stranger, see what your homes and your lives contain. Don't search for something that might be missing, because there's something bound to be missing from every life. Just see what is there. And from the blessed understanding of the certainty which we share, ask yourself an important question. Why am I so lucky? 
Why am I so blessed? So if you ask me what have I learned through the multitude of the experiences which I had, I think I can tell you that I have learned, at least for me, the meaning of life has not dwelt on the momentary heights of achievement and some success, nor in the desperate valleys of pain and tragedy to which I'm no stranger, but that the true meaning of life can be found in the boring, often repetitious pattern of something simply called every day. I hope and pray that your every days full of joy, health, and blessed with peace. Thank you. I've asked that question many, many times. Unfortunately, I have found no answer. All I can answer is again with some hope that one day the measure of love, I hope, is going to be larger than that of hate. Are there any questions? I, I would appreciate it if you ask questions.